I'd like to welcome you all here. Thank you for coming. Um, thank so many for coming. I'm so glad this is a topic of interest. Um, it's one both my co-presenter and I are pretty passionate about. Uh, my name is Carol Lemus. I am currently consulting for an organization called Say Ah, uh, and Anna will tell you a little bit more about that. I have 35 years of doing community health work um, and community-based program development. Um, have an MPH from NYU and I am very happy to be here. Anna, you wanna? Uh, yes. So, um, so my name is Anna Allen, and I am the co-founder and executive director of Say Ah, um, and uh, I'm going to talk, go into a, a deeper dive on Say Ah um, when we get through the more of the introduction. Um, but I had uh, got an email from Carol Lemus who had said she would like to do some volunteering, and I thought to myself, uh, you know, I, I, I said, "Well, do you have any experience?" And she said, "This is what I can do." And I said, "You're hired." <laughs> So we did, we we moved we fast tracked her to the workforce and um and we've hired her as a consultant to work on this uh the development of um some community um community based health literacy materials which which we'll get into um we do have one issue which is that our workshop was supposed to be for twenty five people and there will be breakout room sessions um and they are designed to have small group work in them so we're not entirely sure how that's going to work so we apologize in advance for this but um there's been a miscommunication between us and um and the um being able to get onto the zoom so uh but we'll figure it out as we go okay my understanding was this was supposed to be live streamed from zoom um and that people had trouble getting in so a lot of people have ended up here okay um what we hope to connect um to do today we'll see how much we get through in terms of or the method with which we're going to get to where we want to go um whether we do breakout rooms, we're gonna, we've done some introductions. We're seeing people, um, what they're coming in for. Um, there is a lot of people, there are a lot of people here who are developing materials, um, people who are studying about health literacy and hoping to get some maybe application of what that looks like in practice, uh, increasing community engagement and understanding. Um, there are other people who are passionate about this that are here. Always happy to see passionate people. Um, and uh, if there is anything I missed, I ask people to please raise your hand. Um, I may stop sharing so I can see. Let me see if I can get the a view that lets me see more people. There we go. Um, anyone have an additional? brain I you know brainstorm around what it is they're looking for if not I am going to reshare um let me see again this always happens I'm sorry I apologize there we go okay um so we're diving in with an understanding that the trouble with trying to preserve the health of the body 
is that it's so dif di difficult to do without destroying the health of the mind. And I just want to give context in terms of why I put this quote in here. Um, and quite honestly, I've been dealing with a number of health issues. And I think my mental health is what suffered more than my physical health. And that is due to trying to figure out and navigate the system and get people speaking to each other. So a piece of health li literacy that's really important is helping and supporting people with understanding what their rights and their, their responsibilities are in terms of their care. Um, I'm going to pass this to Anna, and please let me know when you want me to change the slides. Thank, uh, Carol, thank you so much. So, um, so uh, my name again is Anna Allen, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of Say Ah. Um, my background is originally in journalism, and I, um, like Carol currently, was navigating um, some healthcare issues uh, back in the early aughts, and I was going through the system, and I was like, wow, I have a master's degree from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. I have fellowships to, to study overseas. I've had, you know, college education, et cetera, et cetera, and I cannot understand what's going on. And so I started doing some research um, with another writer friend of mine named Helene Fisher, uh, you know, into health communication, and we hit on health literacy, um, and we were like, wow, this is exactly where we are. Um, you know, we, we are struggling with this. Imagine what it's like for somebody who doesn't have the education level and the literacy levels that we have um, and, and our ability to advocate for ourselves. So, um, so with people like that in mind, um, we co-founded Say Ah, uh, and we founded it really with a focus on community members, um, patients, caregivers, and consumers. And our goal is to help the end user, you know, the patient, caregiver, and consumer to gain the skills they need to um, maintain and manage their health and their health care in this incredibly overwhelming and complex system we have. So our organization does this um, through a variety of different channels. Uh, we provide programs um, to patients and caregivers in our communities. Um, these are all skill-based programming uh, that um, support their health literacy levels. Um, and we do this through workshops, curricula and materials, print materials, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, we then train also professionals in health literacy best practices, the plain language, um, universal design teach back. We do a lot of work around narrative competency uh, from, from many different perspectives, and I'll talk more about that as well. Um, we provide plain language and accessible design services, and then we partner with health and community service professionals to improve the health literacy there clients, patients, and consumers. So we um, will go into uh, organizations and work with the organization to see where there's pain points and what we can do to support the health literacy of the people who are navigating the health care system. Um, our advocacy work is, uh, is basically we educate anybody who can make policy change at any opportunity we can. So we work with policymakers, elected officials, um, influencers, and I mean, in the traditional political system, not in the social media system, although that would be helpful, um, to, to really um, surface and center on health literacy and its impact on health outcomes. Slide. Uh, so Say Ah is rooted in the community. Um, we uh, operationalize the definition of health literacy that Janet Ohene Frempong uses, which is what you, which is, um, what you need to know and do to be as well as you can be. We don't um, overly focus on the organizational side of health literacy because we feel like most of the consequences of inadequate health literacy accrue to the patients, caregivers, consumers, family members, and the larger communities. Um, and so that's that's really, again, our focus in all, in all ways, no matter who we're delivering programming to. Um, since our inception in 2007, we have educated more than 13,000 people in person um, at 60 host sites. We're mostly based in New York City in the metro area, although we do do um, online work and can reach out to communities outside of this area. 
Um, and then we've trained more than 2,500 frontline professionals in health literacy best practices. Um, these two uh, parts of our programming really inform each other. And we take what we learn in the community and we bring it back to the professionals. And we take what we learn from the professionals and we bring it back to the community members. Next slide. So some of the community-based programs that we run, um, some of our, our workshops are, um, we have something called Patient 101, which is a very basic, very general um, uh, workshop on how people can um, communicate more effectively with their providers, how they can ensure that they're communicating accurate health information, um, how we teach them how to use TeachBack. Um, we teach them the TeachBack side of the, of the equation because it's shouldn't just be up to the providers to do that in a, in a clinical encounter. Um, so we do these kinds of things with the patients. Uh, we have another workshop called Health Advocacy, and this is in partnership with a political organization. Um, and we provide the, the health literacy skills that somebody would need to navigate the power dynamic uh, and advocate for themselves, again, in the clinical encounter. Um, ER 101 is a workshop that we co-developed with a um, local freestanding ER. And uh, we work with them on teaching people how they can, um, how, what they can do in the ER to be, to, to also get the care that they need and to advocate for themselves. Um, the medical providers talk about medical reasons why someone, you know, you should go directly to an ER. And we talk about how to plan and prepare for that visit um, so you can, you can get safe, effective care. Uh, Take Pride in Your Health is a LGBTQ plus um, workshop that we do with a local uh, older adult center, um, uh, always during Pride Month, um, that we developed with them. Medication safety we've done in concert with the New York City um, Poison Control Center, and then telling your health story is a uh, is a relatively new workshop for us. Um, we developed it about two years ago with health educators from Columbia University's Narrative Medicine Program, and this again we work with the community members and we teach them how to put together their health story. Um, and how to make it concise and effective because that story will drive so much of their diagnosis, their treatment, and their um, and their ability to navigate the system and, and get what they need. So um, again, narrative competency is a huge part of communication. It's a, an enormously impactful part of health communication. Next slide. Um, and then again, we take this work and we... Uh, um, bring it to professionals. Um, some of you may know our organization from our racism and health literacy symposium. We also run health literacy boot camps and different health literacy uh, trainings. Um, and then we speak at a lot of conferences, um, providing health literacy uh, programming and support. Next slide. Next slide. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the the work that Carol and I are going to talk to you about today um, uh, is a, a new program of ours called the K cards, and these cards build on health literacy um, materials that we already produced um, that are very basic materials that help people uh, do what they need to do to get um, better, more safer, and more effective care. So, um, so the cards that we have existing are cards that tell people, you know. Tell all of your doctors what medications you're taking. Tell them important facts about yourself. You know, some of these basic things that, that I think we take for granted and we expect that um, patients and consumers should know to tell this information to us. Um, so so that, was a, that was a first generation card that we had developed back in 2010. Um, after we had produced that card and, um, and many people found it to be very helpful to them, uh, we always thought about returning to these cards and, and doing more messaging for um, patients and, and caregivers, especially people who are not uh, digitally savvy, people who are not using apps, people who need paper, people who prefer paper, people who are more comfortable with paper. Um, we wanted to go back and, and create print materials for them. Um, at the same time we were thinking about this, my very dear friend, Christine Kay, uh, I'm gonna guess it. <laughs> who is a um, was a was a journalist at the New York Times? Um, she was dealing with medic metastatic breast cancer, and as she was going through that, I could see so many places where her health literacy fell down. 
where she really needed support and she really needed to know how to navigate the system. And she needed people around her who could support her and who could be very assertive uh, to ensure she was both getting the care she needed and saying no to care she did not need. So, um, so uh, uh, through that um, challenging period, um, at the end of which she passed, um, she had uh, left say uh, seed funding to develop these cards. Um, and an example of, um, I'm just gonna talk about some health literacy examples that have been in the back of our mind in developing these cards um, and also in all of our programming, uh, two stories that come to mind. The first is when um, say uh, we did our very first workshop in 2008, we were founded in 2007, but we started our workshops in 2008. We went into a community center um, in uh, that was housed in, or still is housed in um, NYCHA, which is the New York City Housing Authority, um, NYCHA housing site. Um, and it was uh, for people, the community center, um, supported people who are living in poverty um, uh, or who have low incomes. And um, and so we had done a workshop on how to get more out of your doctor's visit, pretty basic, you know, we thought, um, went through this workshop. At the end of it, a gentleman came up to me and he said to me, he's like, I have a question for you. And I'm like, oh, great. Okay. So we're here. Um, you know, what do you need? And he said, can you help me uh, with my glucometer? And I said, I said, well, what help do you need? He said, well, I don't know how to use it. And I said, well, I'm not allowed to provide health and medical information to you by law. Our, our attorneys were very clear about this in our workshops. I said, but I can give you the health literacy advice, which is to go back to the doctor who prescribed this for you and um, and ask that and ask your doctor. And he said, I can't because I've been reporting fake numbers to her for the last six months. So that was, that was something that came up in our first workshop. Um, something that came up during uh, Christine Kay's care um, she had worked on um, creating a new healthcare proxy because she knew she her health was failing. She may have an experience where she can't advocate for herself. So she had done this uh, well in advance of, of really truly the end of her life care. And um, and it kept saying to her, make sure, make sure it's uploaded in the system, make sure it's uploaded in the system, you know, make sure that you don't just fill this out, but that it gets into your file. So, uh, so fast forward a couple of months, she was in the hospital, she was being discharged basically into hospice. Uh, they called the person on her healthcare proxy that was on file. And it was somebody who she had put on about 10 years ago. That was the, what they had on file that she was no, no longer even speaking to. And that person said, why are you calling me? So, um, so we know that health literacy isn't just about knowing how to take your medications. Um, it's also about being able to advocate for yourself, making sure that things like your healthcare proxy are is uploaded correctly, um, that you really do understand how to use your glucometer, um, that you don't have shame around your ability to understand these things, that you can advocate for yourself. These are all pieces of health literacy. And, and through this, we wanted to develop a set of cards that were um, grounded in uh, community-based research um, so that we could help people in these situations have a tool that they could use uh, that would support them in their ability to advocate for themselves and navigate the healthcare system. From the Move on? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let me get, there we go. And I've got to move this and that. Okay. So, um, most research traditionally happens with an outsider coming in and gathering data through observations, through sur surveys, through focus groups, whatever. But they're basically coming in to learn about the community and leave. Um, they publish, they go around the world presenting on it. And after the community has put time into helping support this research, the problem doesn't really get resolved. 
So traditional research, the researcher defines the problem in the community-based participatory research, the community identifies the problem or concern with the researcher to identify what the focus will be. Um, as I said, it's research on community and traditional research. Community-based participatory research is research with the community as full participants. People are, are subjects in traditional research. People are participants and collaborators in community-based. The researchers gain the skills and knowledge um, in traditional research, but in community-based, the researcher and community work to help build the community's capacity. In other words, you're not stepping back out of the community once you finish your research, you're creating resources within the community that will remain there and help move the community towards, in this case, improved overall health. Uh, traditional research is, researchers control the process, the resources, and how they interpret the data. Community-based participatory participatory research, what I love about it is that the data belongs to everyone. This is not just in the hands of the researchers, but the community is also benefiting by identifying and participating and gaining capacity to address the concerns of, the, of their community. Um, in traditional research, researchers own data and control use and dissemination. As I said, I got into the field of health 35 years ago on a research project. And I was running health, health education groups and cognitive behavioral groups. The researchers, this was in Harlem. We were in Central and East Harlem, and I will tell you that the researchers during the period of research never set foot in the community. It was all the data that we were feeding them, but they never, ever set foot in the community. Whereas community-based participatory research, the data belongs to everyone, and it's a community. A collaborative process in deciding how it will be used and how it will be disseminated. So it acknowledges the community as the primary unit of identity. Okay. It, this is not a one on one intervention, it's a process by which you're looking at a certain group of people. Um, it enhances and builds on existing strengths of the community. As I said, you want to leave behind something when you're not there anymore. And so if we can develop the resources, essentially, this is going back. I got into the field of HIV very, very early in the epidemic. And quite honestly, I would have loved to have my job cease to exist. That it would, that, that HIV would have disappeared and there wouldn't be a need for me anymore. Um, that's the idea of developing the resources in the community so that it's not dependent on somebody external community to act. It fosters collaborative relationships between academic institution and community partners throughout the entire process. And those relationships remain once the research ends. And knowledge gained through the partnership is translated into action. Very different from traditional. They identify a problem, they look at it from all, all angles and present their data. 
But here with community-based research, something has to come out of it that benefits the community. So um, if we look at what we've been doing in the development of the K cards, we started by identifying what our objectives were. What was it that should be coming out of this process? So we did initial data collection, okay? We ran focus groups um, in person with the target population that needs this type of resource, people who are struggling with health literacy. We asked them questions about where they got their health care. What were their concerns re with respect to the quality of the health care? Um, what they wish their providers would do when they go for an appointment. Um, how, what kind of assistance do they need in terms of understanding medical billing? And what experiences did they want to share to demonstrate some of their concerns? The next step in the process was to talk to basically clinically su clinical support staff. We recognize providers are very, very busy. Um, and usually, depending on where they work, have limited time slots that they can dedicate to the patients they see. So the clinical support staff usually becomes the bridge between the patient and the provider. So we did some focus groups. We attempted to do them online. Um, we got a very broad range, range of participation that really was not as helpful as we hoped. Um, we did recruiting on Facebook through nurses groups or PA groups, um, ended up getting people who were office people or billers or I don't know, I think one of them was a veterinarian, but um, we felt that we still needed to get some more information about from, from support staff, clinical support staff. So then we did a series of targeted interviews with people who really serve in that role and asked questions about what barriers they saw in patients getting the medical care they need, what kinds of things would make it easier to assist the patients, um, what, what would they want from their patients in order to support them in getting the best medical care possible? Um, what, how, how did they feel provider-patient communication could be improved? Um, what can patients do to improve their experiences when they see their medical providers? And what were the important questions to ask when they see their providers? And out of that, we did an analysis of the data, identified the broad themes, and then developed messaging that corresponded to those themes out of the data that we got from the focus groups. Our next step is to have another round of focus groups and interviews to have people review um, the messaging that we develop based on their input. And then we will be making any adaptations that we get out of this next round of focus groups, integrating it back into the messaging and hopefully be able to launch. So um, we have 51 people 
here that I'm seeing. Ed, are you still with us? Uh, yes, I am. So, actually, Carol, how Carol, many people are actually in here? Right now, you have 43. I was going to admit some more so you, you get to 50 with the people in the waiting room, if you like. Um, uh, There's no way we can do breakout rooms with 50 people. Okay. We're at 42 um, right now. Do you want to try it with six people per group or seven, Anna? We got to uh, roll with the flow. Okay. Yeah, I, there's going to be some overflow. So I, I just want to, um, before we go into the next thing, I just wanted to make something clear because I'm getting questions in the chat. Um, so the purpose of this is to look at the research um, style that we did. So this can be something that you can take back to your own um, work as you're creating um, materials to support your communities. Um, and we do not, we have not finished the K cards. So um, we are still in the process. We're just uh, helping you understand it the process using the K cards as an example. So um, for people who had, had asked about that. Uh, so we're gonna go into these breakout rooms and um, and I think we should just let everybody go into a breakout room. Um, we were gonna do smaller groups, but I think this is what it is. So we're gonna go into breakout rooms. Um, in your breakout room, you wanna identify a note taker, identify a presenter. Uh, you want to review the community-based approach. Then identify the target community that you want to help. Carol, do you want to go through the rest of the list? Okay, so um, basically we would like you to work on developing a plan yourselves. Um, uh, you want to review the community-based approach. Then identify the target community that you want to help. Excuse me? Or do you want to go? Oh, okay. Um, we want to, we're going to, basically what I want is the first and second steps that we're seeing on the screen right now. So you may be in a group with people working with several different populations. Choose one in your group that you want to focus on what broad message do you want to give the next step would be to say okay who in the community can provide us feedback around what messages people need to hear and what are some of the broader themes that come up. That's why we chose clinical support staff and we chose patients. Um, so think about who you want to gather data with and, and think of Let's say three three questions. Um, I'm going to move to the next one. Instead of six, because we have so many people here, three key questions that you would uh, that you would ask the group of people that you're choosing to provide the feedback on what you want to develop. Is that clearer? I'm going to look in the chat. If it's not as a group that is community based and how we know, um, you are coming together as a group that's that is going to be working with the community to develop materials that can communicate a chosen message. So for us, it was health literacy. In your group, you may want to look at, I don't know, um, green areas in the community. And if that's what you choose, who would you speak to about that to gather information? And what would you ask them? Does that make it clearer?
Good. I'm getting some yeses. Okay. Um, Anna and I will be popping in to the groups to answer any questions. We'll be in for a couple of minutes. Um, I'm going to give you 10 minutes. Actually, let's work. I'm going to give you eight minutes because we've got a lot of groups to present back. Okay. No more than three questions. And Ed, can you break them up into six groups, please? Sure. So six breakout rooms? Yes. With Anna okay. and, and myself left out. Yeah. And I, okay. I just put in the chat, I just put in the chat um what you're gonna do. Yeah, and we're gonna but, uh, assign them automatically. Yeah, you can do that automatically. Okay, and then uh here we go. Six rooms. Oh, well, thank you. We'll be in your groups, and uh, you can ask any questions there. Um, please join your groups. You should be getting a message on your screen. Are a lot fewer people in the groups than one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, they're smaller groups than we expected. Um, I may move one to group six and one to group five in one of the larger rooms. So, um, Was that who I moved? And I'm going to move somebody here to, oh, now there are only four people per group. Okay. Um, hmm, that's interesting. The groups are shrinking. And there are people here still, are there? Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. That way I can see who's here. Okay, so there's only one person here. Um, okay, so um, Anna, you wanna jump into I one, two, and three, been... and I can oh. do four, five, and six. Mine says I've been assigned to breakout room six. Okay, you. so you go there. Is Anna co-host too, Ed? Yeah, she is. I have her as a co-host. But but Anna, I have you in here twice. Uh, if you look at the uh, who's in here, you have you as a co-host. And I'm not sure if that's why I assigned you. Okay. Uh... So, so you can you should be able to get out of that room regardless, but you are a co-host. Okay, so the, um mm -hmm. you should be able to go to more and see breakout rooms. Okay. And then you can it'll pop up and you can join one, two. I'm gonna put this person again into a different okay, room because renamed. there are a couple of small rooms. Okay. Um, I just renamed Anna Allen Say Ah. Can you make, am I a co-host? Oh, yes. I, I can uh, uh, co-host, correct? Okay. Okay. I'm going to start with rooms four, five, and six, Anna. Okay. Then I'll do one, two, three. Okay. okay. You should be good, in. Okay. Okay, great. Okay.
Oh, Ed, in room four, there is somebody who is having problems. She can't access the chat or oh, let's the see. video. If you could just check on that, I'm going to keep going. In room four. Into okay, room. Take, okay, thank you so much. Hello, Carol. Just let me know when you want me to close the rooms. I'll be on standby. Oh, I, you're on mute. Can you please send uh, all the rooms a message saying three more minutes? I sure will right now. Thank you. You got it. Okay, well, just let me know. Give me a heads up and I'll close them. Okay. Oh, and Carol, uh, about the confusion earlier, I passed all the information on to the staff. And I also uh -huh. took screen, I took screenshots of who made it in. And who didn't? So they'll have okay. that to work with too. They said they'll they'll uh, take a look at that. 
Okay, thank you very much, Ed. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. It, kind yeah, of it just kind of took me by surprise. <laughs> yeah, and it should have been capped at 50. I, I saw that. So, uh, like I said, they have that information right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And they told you 50? Uh, let me double check uh, what I have. Because we had, we had, they asked us. And we had said 25. Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. It is 25. I'm, I was looking at the wrong one. It was supposed to be capped at 25. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to add that into the email too. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you do the one minute um, warning, please? I sure can. I'll do it right now. And then it'll automatically close. Now, I'll have to close it this time. So uh, just, get, okay. just let me know. I just broadcasted it. And let okay. me know when I'm going to close it, and I'll close it. Okay. We should probably close them out now. Yes, ma'am. I'm doing that right now. Thank you so much. You got it. So yeah, it'll it'll close in a, in less than a minute. It okay, has, it has it gives its own thirty countdown. seconds. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like five and six are not coming back. Oh, it says 18 seconds. Okay, I'm seeing. Thank you. Okay. Um Let's do a quick report back. I am going to mention the name of one person in the room that'll let you know which room you are in. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask you to present in about a minute um, because we're getting to the end of the workshop and then we can discuss it after rather than getting into each group's individual questions, we can kind of talk about the process. So room one had Andy Masters, Heather Alberta, Jeanette Valladolid. Who's presenting back? I am, this is Heather. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. All right, so I'm not sure if we did it exactly how you asked or what you're looking for. So we're a little nervous to be group number one, but We'll we, be nervous. we were nervous when we saw 75 people in the room. Good. So, so we um, chose our um, LGBT community just based on the recent, um, again, insurgence of the MPOX um, cases that, we, uh, that we're seeing in Chicago. So we would use that as our target audience in terms of our community and how we would reach out to our community members. We would utilize the LGBT centers, um, the faith community, some universities, as well as um, potentially partner with the foundations and um, with some of the local nightclubs. Um, we thought about doing the data collection in the month of June when it's Pride Month so that we can collaborate and partner with already existing um, celebrations or festivals or things that are going on. And then I'm always a big proponent of that people's time and lived experience is worth um, being paid for. And so working potentially with the foundation to have some sort of stipend for those individuals that we're collecting the data from. The part that we didn't get to was the questions that we were gonna ask. So that's, we ended right when that button, the question piece, but that's what we had put together thus far. 
Thank you so much, Group One. Um, if I can figure out how to do this, I will do a celebration there. And Group Two had Erin Hodge and Kanika Chakara. Somebody presenting back there. I think our other group member who is presenting is gone, um, but we did our uh, little breakout room on communities experiencing food deserts. So we defined it as any area without a proper grocery store or supermarket providing fresh fruit and vegetables within a certain mileage. Our community panel would be any community members interested in this issue, health practitioners, um, registered dietitians and community health workers who are more in tune um, with the community they serve. We would collect data from local health departments, such as like how many SNAP participants are, are enrolled in that area. We would also conduct informal community surveys. And then a few questions that Anna was very helpful with, we would ask our how far do you have to travel to get fresh produce? Do you qualify for government benefits such as SNAP or WIC? Or do any local farmers markets accept SNAP or EBT? Great questions. Thank you. Thank okay. You. you also deserve a celebration there. Um, room three, Angela Lee, Jenny M., Sophie Nachman. Yeah, so um, we focused our, our message was um, to senior citizens, possibly in a more rural setting, about the importance of getting the newer vaccine, um, the updated vaccine. And we focused our messaging or, or, or looked to these following places to provide for community, like key stakeholders to provide input on our messaging. They would be maybe from senior citizen centers, um, maybe through the Meals on Wheels programs, maybe libraries, grocery stores, pharmacies. Um, and the questions that we came up with that might help inform the messaging or what challenges or barriers have you had to getting the vaccine that might help us inform, you know, the following action items or messages. Um, another question might be, did you know that your vaccine, your current vaccine is outdated and that you need a new one? And then another question might be, um, uh, do you know where to go to get information or who to ask about the new vaccine? So that's about as far as we got. Thank you. Good job, group three. Okay, group room four was Marcy Page uh, V. Hot and Zain Zainab. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, you're you're good. Thank you. It's Zainab. Um, oh, I'm I'll be sorry. happy to. No worries. I'll be happy to uh, present for our group. Um, so okay. we were interested in. Uh, working with patients to help develop um, their medication and treatment plans and help them stick to those plans. Uh, so the sources of data that we were considering were pharmacists, uh, patients, and caregivers. And the questions we came up with uh, were what have providers done that has helped you with your treatment plan in the past? Like for example, teach back, um, what, who helps you with your routine? You know, who are the support people? Uh, that help you uh, stay on your medication plan? And then what are some of the barriers for taking your medications correctly or understanding your treatment plan? And how do you overcome those barriers? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I see it. I see it's five o'clock. I did give you your, your celebration. You deserve it. Uh, we, it's five o'clock. We're almost done. I'm going to ask those who can bear with us, um, we should be done, I'm hoping, in about five or six more minutes. Um, was Alyssa, Aman, Amy, Nicole, and Sonia. Who's presenting? I am. And 
Um, we picked um, a campaign about lung cancer screenings uh, or target communities, people at risk for lung cancer. Uh, we identified um, community leaders as um, community health workers. And we thought about representatives and spokespeople as in um, the American Lung Association. We also um, talked about healthcare practitioners in um, screening centers for our venue, um, for data collection. Um, we discussed the, the use of focus groups and surveys of people who go to screenings, as well as people who don't go to screenings. Um, and that would include smokers and non-smokers. Um, and questions that we would ask um, would be, what motivated you to go to the screening? What barriers did you experience getting to the screening? Um, for people who chose not to get screened, um, why did you not get screened? Um, what are your preferred sources or methods of communication? Um, what messaging or information would be most effective to get you to be screened? Okay, great. Thank you so much. We'll give you your props. Group five and Mariana. Robin and Stephanie are our last group. Yeah, hi, this is Stephanie. Um, so we combined a couple of our current um, topics we're all working on, and we decided that our priority community would be women of um, childbearing years, and specifically Spanish-speaking, uh, low literacy, low resource, hard to reach. Um, and our idea was to get out the message about the Medicaid unwinding, about how important renewals are, but there's a time component. You can't renew early or you may lose coverage early if you no longer qualify. And just really focused on how do we get that message out into the community and it, make it be the right message so people know what to do and when to do it. And we decided we would work with uh, churches um, free and low-income clinics, shelters, and community organizations that provide uh, resources to schedule focus groups and get really some community co-created ideas of what the message should be um, and uh, where it should be. Where would they want to find that message? And then what sort of resources would they need to effectively be able to check their date and know where to reach out for help when they needed it? Very good. Thank you all. Um, I, I think there were some general things that came up that were important. Um, identifying people from the community to work with you. Um, I would always stress include the end user um whatever it is you are aiming for questions you guys did amazing with quest open-ended questions always ask open-ended if you're doing a focus group um surveys you can do a combination um surveys tend to be more quantitative whereas focus groups are more qualitative and I think you hit the nail on the head with your questions. So um, comments, questions, reflections, or I want to get the hell out of here. <laughs> I think we're on the last then. This is how you can reach me, sepota at verizon.net. Anna can be reached at alan at say-ah.org. And there is a website for Say Ah, www.say-ah.org. Anna, you have anything to add? You're muted. Uh, no. I'm muted. Sorry. There we I go. just wanted to thank everyone for coming and um and everybody did a great job in an incredibly compressed time in those groups. I mean, really phenomenal. And we just hope you apply this as you go out and you do your research. And this is again where that plain language um 
cultural competency, all that stuff. Uh, this is where the rubber hits the road in these communications. Okay, well, thank you for hanging in with us and have a lovely evening. I hope you got something out of it.